maybe unmute Bruce if um oh sorry there can there you, you go me yes we can all right uh, only that jo General Gordon Granger is not only a very interesting person uh, to talk about but also he's one that didn't hasn't received a lot of recognition until just recently and we'll talk a little bit about that in the uh, the video you're about to see. Very good, and uh, and a big thank you to Bruce and the town of Sotus. Um, and uh, with that, we will get started with the video. Uh, we did test this last week, but uh, keep your fingers crossed that the technology interface between YouTube and Zoom works. So. specifically going over the following in this presentation we will be talking about the life of Gordon Granger specifically going over the following topics his early life in Joy and Phelps New York West Point Gordon Granger the man the love of his life, Mexican and civil wars, Juneteenth, his final years, his legacy, and then have time for questions and answers. Gordon Granger was born on November 6, 1821 in the small hamlet of Joy, New York, which is a few miles south of the village of Sotus. He was the eldest child of Gaius Granger and Catherine Taylor Granger. His father built the first house in Joy and was initially a farmer and later ran a sawmill there. Gordon had two younger sisters, Emmeline and Catherine, who would outlive him and remained unmarried and stayed in the Joy area. You will see from this presentation that Gordon Granger was a man who overcame great adversity in his life which reads like a combination Shakespearean romance and tragedy. His mother died on April 17, 1825, at age 25, less than a month after the birth of her youngest child. She was buried at the Johnson Burial Grounds, south of Sotus, on Route 88. Gordon was about three and a half years old at the time. His father remarried 18-year-old Sarah Sally Emery, on November 19, 1826, just after Gordon's fifth birthday, and the remarriage produced 10 additional children. Gordon was sent to live with his paternal grandparents in Phelps, New York, as a teenager. We are not certain of the reason for this move, but being the eldest child with so many siblings was probably a factor. Gordon's grandfather, Major Elihu Granger, quickly realized that Gordon had an active mind and a remarkable retentive memory, and as a result, he learned very fast. His father gave permission for him to attend district school and then on to the Marion Academy. With some extra review in his studies at SOTUS, he passed an examination in 1840 and was awarded a certificate to teach. In the fall of 1840, he became the first teacher of the brand new Soda School No. 16 on Preemption Road that was a few miles from his home in Joy. In the spring of 1841, Judge Byron Green of Sotus was appointed to the examination committee for the military at West Point. Judge Green brought back a pamphlet from West Point which set forth the rules and requirements concerning entering that great military school. After reading the pamphlet, Gordon was determined to get the cadet appointment of his district. With the recommendation of Judge Green, together with Orrin Archer, his former teacher at Marion, he secured an appointment for an examination to become a cadet at West Point. After passing the examination and returning home, a young Gordon Granger remarked, I have got back alive. 
Gordon Granger attended West Point and graduated as part of the class of 1845. He graduated 35th out of a class of 41. One reason for his low ranking was that during his four years at West Point, Granger received 139 demerits, which was unusually high. By comparison, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson received zero demerits. Upon graduation, he was commissioned a brevet second lieutenant in the 2nd Infantry. Gordon Granger was a Democrat, as nearly all the Grangers were. He was a war Democrat, not a pro-slavery Democrat. While it is true that some people talked of Gordon Granger's acts of kindness, most people described him as gruff. He believed all people should be treated fairly and equally. Gordon was often blunt and diplomacy was not his strong suit. If you said something to him which he believed was untrue, he would tell you so. This was true in military life to both subordinates and superiors. This did not endear him to General Grant, which would prove important to him soon after his Juneteenth proclamation. According to a 1906 memoir by friend Palmer, who spent time in Detroit with Granger in 1845, Granger was a, quote, rough diamond. Indeed, the roughest specimen of a West Point graduate I or anyone else ever saw. Gordon suffered poor health during most of his life. It is believed he suffered severe bronchitis. He had to take extended sick leave several times during his military career. After graduation from West Point, Gordon visited friends and then reported for duty and was stationed in Detroit. There he became acquainted with a young French lady of aristocratic birth, accompanied by her mother, who were visiting the United States. He became betrothed to the young lady, and after her return to France, they kept up a regular correspondence. His service moved him from place to place, but all the while he was faithful to his French sweetheart. After the Mexican War, Gordon Granger was given a furlough, and he left for France to claim his fiancée and bring her back with him. Upon his arrival in France, he was surprised, shocked, and dismayed to learn that the mother would not permit her daughter to marry an officer who was not wealthy. The situation was trying. Their love was passionately fervent. They saw no happiness, separated, and there was no hope for a reconciliation. Finally, the daughter proposed an elopement, but to this proposition, an officer of honor in the United States service, he could not consent. His lady love became frantic while he was completely overwhelmed with the condition of things. He returned to America alone and resumed his military career. One day, years later, he was called to a certain house. As he arrived, to his astonishment, he was greeted by the French mother and accompanied by her daughter who had gone insane from the lost love. The mother felt the bitterest pang of remorse at what her opposition had done to her daughter and as a last hope, hoped that a reunion would cure her daughter. Alas, the love of his life was too far gone and saw him not. Utterly crushed, the French aristocrat returned to France with her daughter and were never heard from again. One can only imagine losing the love of his life a second time. In 1846, Granger was transferred to the Mounted Rifles, a regiment organized to protect the overland trails to Oregon and was part of Winfield Scott's army. At the beginning of the Mexican War, he accompanied the, this regiment to Mexico. The horses were all lost in the Gulf during the transit, and the regiment was ordered to serve on foot. From Veracruz to Mexico City, Lieutenant Granger was in every battle and always distinguished himself for his courage and coolness under fire. For his gallant and meritorious conduct at the battles of Conteras and Churubusco, he was breveted first lieutenant. At the battle of Chapultepec, he received another brevet promotion, this time to captain. He would not attain that rank in the regular army until the Civil War, but his outstanding combat record in Mexico had been officially recognized. An anonymous fellow officer in the mounted rifles at his memorial said, he did not fight for brevets or for the glory. He went into battle for the pure love of the thing. After the Mexican-American War on May 10, 1849, Granger and the Riflemen set out 
on an epic 2,000-mile journey to the Pacific coast of Oregon, which took six months. It was the longest march ever attempted in this country up to that time. Once there, they built Fort Vancouver in Washington State on the northern side of the Columbus River, near Portland, Oregon. In 1851, the rifleman went back to Missouri, and Granger got a year's leave of absence, where he tried unsuccessfully to marry his French sweetheart. From 1852 to 1858, Granger was constantly engaged in frontier scouting. He often was engaged in fierce combat with the hostile Comanches and Apaches. Granger spoke of this time as the happiest period of his service. In 1858 to 1859, Granger escorted the commanding officer of the Department of New Mexico, which was a post he himself would hold in the 1870s. Granger was away on sick leave from March 1860 until April 1861. On November 6, 1860, Granger turned 39 and was still a first lieutenant. This was a slow promotion track, especially for someone who had seen precious little peaceful service. He was wearing out his health for a very small reward, and one wonders if he had thoughts of leaving the service, which was common for pre-war officers. When Fort Sumter was attacked by the Confederates on April 12, 1861, inaugurating the Civil War, Granger was still on sick leave in New York City. He immediately reported for duty. On May 5, 1862, he at last got a regular Army promotion to captain. Granger had been in the Southwest when the secession movement began and had witnessed the formation of military companies and the incessant drilling. He did not conceal his belief that the Union would find the war much longer and harder than many of his fellow Union officers thought. Granger's leadership during the battle at Wilson's Creek was reported to Washington as distinguished for active and conspicuous gallantry. Promotions to major and then colonel soon followed. As mentioned before, Granger often rubbed superior officers the wrong way. General Pope summed him up this way. Granger was a man of brains and courage, but I think a coarser grained man, both in looks and in manners, I never saw. His superior officers respected his leadership abilities, but did not like the man. Nevertheless, Granger became General Pope's right-hand man, and on March 26, 1862, he was promoted to Brigadier General. These leadership skills of Gordon Granger would be put to the test in the largest battle fought in Georgia, the Battle of Chickamauga, fought from September 18th through the 20th, 1863. Here is a map of the battle on September 20th at about 1 p.m. You can see that Union General Thomas's 14th Corps in blue is being attacked by a large Confederate Army of Tennessee pictured in red under General Bragg. Granger's army is in reserve in the upper left corner. On September 20th, 1863, during the second day of the Battle of Chickamauga, he reinforced without orders General Thomas's 14th Corps, which was about to collapse. This action staved off the Confederate attackers until dark and prevented a disaster for the Union Army. Gordon Granger would go on to fight with distinction in the Battle of Missionary Ridge, the Battle of Mobile Bay, and the Battle of Fort Blakely, but his actions on September 20th, 1863, cemented his reputation as a great strategic military commander and earned him the title, the Savior of Chickamauga. On April 9th, 1865, Robert E. Lee surrendered his Army of Northern Virginia to General Ulysses S. Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. On May 26, 1865, General Buckner agreed to surrender the Confederate troops west of the Mississippi, which was formalized on June 2nd. General Sheridan, who headed up the military division of the Southwest, ordered General Granger and his 6,000 men to go from Mobile, Alabama, to Galveston, Texas. For Granger, it was a rendezvous with destiny. Tomorrow is Juneteenth in Texas, 
Some of you may wonder, what exactly is that? Well, it commemorates June 19, 1865, when Union Army General Gordon Granger stood on the balcony of the Ashton Villa in Galveston and said in part, in accordance with a proclamation, all slaves are free. He was referring to President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation that was issued in January of 1863. So why did it take so long for word to reach slaves in Texas? Texas, remember, was part of the Confederacy and the war didn't end until April of 1865. So until the Union Army arrived in Galveston two months later, slaves there weren't aware of the proclamation. And until the war was over, the proclamation was meaningless. In 1866, former Texas slaves began celebrating Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day, a celebration that continues to this very day. Good morning. As you know, I recently arrived under orders from General Grant to take command of the Military District of Texas. We've established our headquarters here in Galveston. This morning, I have signed a number of general orders to be carried out throughout the entire district that will be promulgated later, both in print and by speech. To this august body, I would draw your attention to general order number three. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. Let me say that again. All slaves are free. All slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They're informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts, and they will not be supported in idleness either there or anywhere else. By my hand, Major General Granger, to be promulgated by the, Ad the Adjutant General Major Emery this June 19th, 1865. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the war is over. The slaves are free. Yeah. Yeah. A question about Juneteenth that often comes up is, what motivated Granger to make the proclamation that all slaves are free? The short answer is that his boss, General Sheridan, ordered him to do it. On June 13, 1865, Sheridan directed Granger, on your arrival at Galveston, notify the people of Texas that in accordance with the existing proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free. Advise all such freedmen that they must remain at home that they will not be allowed to collect at military post and will not be supported in idleness. Indeed, most of the proclamation was written by General Sheraton, although Granger did tone it down somewhat. Here is a fun fact. An almost identical proclamation was read aloud by Union General Edward McCook on May 20th, 1865, one month earlier, in Tallahassee, the capital of Florida, announcing the demise of slavery in that state. The reason that history does not record this event is that in Florida, the slaves were already aware of their previous emancipation. When Granger got to Galveston, Texas was in a chaotic state of affairs. Almost all the Confederate troops had disbanded before the surrender, and many were either going into exile in Mexico or thinking about it. During the Civil War, France had invaded Mexico in violation of the Monroe Doctrine. The Union had sent the opposition some support. Grant and others feared this alliance with the opposition might spur a new rebellion and fighting in Texas. 
Although Granger was doing a good job at administering the state, Grant did not like him. Yes, he grudgingly admitted he was a good leader and administrator, but he clashed with his personality. On July 19, 1865, a month to the day after Juneteenth, Granger was relieved of command and in early August he left Galveston by ship bound for New Orleans. The post-Civil War era saw an ever-shrinking and consolidated Union Army. Granger found himself awaiting orders for the rest of 1865 and 1866. Back in New York City in 1867, he suffered an attack of acute retinitis that would leave him blind in his left eye by 1873. In 1868, Granger was in Washington, D.C. at the request of President Johnson and was even involved in the defense of President Johnson's impeachment. On July 14, 1869, Granger married Maria Letcher, whose family were from Lexington, Kentucky. As an aging, middle-aged husband, Granger became a milder, more content, and civilized person under his wife's influence. His wife was 20 years younger than Granger and was 27 at the time of their marriage. She was described as highly intelligent and an ornament to society. On October 22, 1870, a son was born, Gordon Granger II. In December 1870, he was transferred to the 15th Artillery, then stationed in New Mexico. Being the senior officer in the territory, he was given command with his headquarters at Santa Fe. His command was in effect from April 29, 1871 to June 1, 1873. Once more, his poor health forced him to be on sick leave of absence until October 31, 1875. He resumed command on that day, but died a couple of months later on January 10, 1876, at the age of 54. He was buried at his wife's hometown at the Lexington Cemetery in Kentucky. Texas became the first state to designate Juneteenth as a state holiday in 1980. In October 2020, Governor Andrew Cuomo signed a bill into law that designated Juneteenth as a New York state holiday. On June 17, 2021, President Joe Biden signed a bill designating Juneteenth as a federal holiday. As of October 2021, nearly all states recognize Juneteenth in some fashion. Due to the increased interest of Juneteenth throughout the United States, Gordon Granger has become well recognized as the man behind Juneteenth. Ironically, few people in Wayne County are aware that he was born here in a small hamlet near Sotus, New York. The Town of Sotus Historical Society is pursuing getting a Pomeroy marker to be placed in the Hamlet of Joy to commemorate his life and place in history. Well, I hope folks enjoyed that um, documentary, a, a Bruce, that is uh, just a, a fantastic account of a, um, a up until now little known, uh, uh, we are, hang on. Yeah, yeah, all right. We have to turn off YouTube. There we go. All right. So um, that, as I was saying, that was a fantastic account of General Granger, someone I knew zero about until this past year. Um, and uh, actually, Bruce was on our um, public radio station uh, earlier this year, I think in June, um, WXXI. And that's where I first heard about General Granger. And uh, my interest was piqued as a um, 
uh, local history buff, and I was just uh, taken with the uh, local connection to to Juneteenth, which is being, uh, as as we uh, saw in the video, um, much more uh, widely recognized uh, than it had been uh, until recently. So, uh, as I was chatting with Bruce before we started today. Um, I, uh, I'm just amazed by how many historical figures have their, have their uh, origins or some connection to upstate New York. And, uh, and I add uh, General Granger to that list. So uh, with that, uh, I don't know if there are any uh, questions out there or if Bruce wants to add anything uh, uh, tonight. Feel free to unmute yourselves if uh, if anyone has a question or comment. Well, seeing none this evening, Bruce, any uh, any final words for us uh, tonight before we um, before we head out? I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and uh, just to let you know, we are pursuing a marker, like I said in the presentation. And when we went to Joy this earlier this year, we were astounded to find out that uh, his house is still standing, um, and that we hope that. By doing this, we can give him the recognition uh, that he deserves, and really up to this point has not gotten locally. The um, the photo you had of the house, did, could you tell? Is it still occupied, or is it is it vacant? And it is vacant at the moment. The lady who owns it is trying to fix it up. Um, I'm hoping that somewhere along the line, with the increased uh, presence of Juneteenth and the celebration that the house might be even restored at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would love to see that too. And it just, it, it adds to, um, uh, you know, Rochester and the Rochester region's uh, legacy of, of, um, of abolition and anti-slavery and, and uh, 19th century progressive causes. So, um, um, so again, thank you. Um, thank you for putting this together. Um, and um, thank you so much for participating in, uh, in our local government workshop. And uh, thank you all, all for attending. And uh, I'll leave the meeting open in case anybody has some last uh, questions, but uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you.